This is Wellness by Design, and I'm your host, Andrew Whitfield-Cook. Joining us today is the famed Linda Gripperich from Love and Guts, a naturopath who specialises in gut therapy and has learned from the best across our professions. Welcome to Wellness by Design, Linda. How are you going? Well, like I said to you before jumping on, I'm a little bit nervous because it's you, Andrew, and if I could oh, only, stop. you know, <laughs> aspire to be... The, as good an interviewer as you are, then then yeah. I will die a happy woman. So I'm I'm very honoured to be on you. here today. Don't die, don't die, <laughs> don't do don't be doing that. I don't plan to any time. We need soon, you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why you're nervous. I'm not that scary, ugly, but not that. You're scary. not scary. Um, so Linda, firstly, like you've developed over you know quite a few years, love and guts. And obviously you've got a heartfelt dedication to healing from the gut without. Take us a little bit through your history and what led you to specialise in gut health? Well, I was one of the, uh, back in the day when I graduated as a, as a naturopath, I graduated in 2002 and practised for about four years, then took a seven-year hiatus. So, and I went to work for a supplement company and we would travel a lot and I would notice uh, my bowel movements be a bit more compromised when we would travel. So I was interested in gut health overall as just being a naturopath but with my own experience. But then when I went back into practice, um, my husband said to me, look, what do you really enjoy working with? And I said, gut health. And he said, look, you know, where's your special, what do you want to specialise in? And I said, you know, People really struggle with constipation and it's so taboo. People are embarrassed to talk about it. Sometimes it can take a few consultations before they really get honest with what's happening with the human plumbing. And so that's why I went down the route of constipation. And you probably, I don't know if you noticed with the Love and Guts podcast, it's not just focused on uh, directly how we can support gut health. It's, it's also looking at mind and movement and all those sorts of things because that is equally as important and can affect gut health as well as constipation. So that's a really brief rundown. And, and that's indeed what we'll be talking about today, that this sort of taboo topic of constipation. What I find really interesting, being a nurse, there's this, it's pretty well known and nurses are pretty well known for being a bit, you know, throwaway comments with bowel movements and things like that because we're so used to it. But, but what I think is interesting is as people age, it almost becomes a topic <laughs> it's it's really funny certainly between couples it's like I'm doing a poo now it's like it really is like <laughs> parents and children it's really funny um this you know is it is it trust between partners over years and all of that sort of thing probably but it's really funny how the topic in particularly elderly people it becomes a a, no, a non-issue of discussion it's like yeah yeah, I'm bound up like you wouldn't believe, like you know, that sort of thing. Yeah. But most of us, it's really still this quite a taboo topic, you know. So I guess first we're to start, let's go through some definitions. Um, you know, is there defined criteria of constipation, the definition of why, uh, you know, take us through these definitions, what they mean. And I think it's important for us to really maybe go through the Rome 4 criteria. So if you don't mind me running through functional constipation and then my thoughts on it, maybe. <laughs> so the Rome 4 criteria, which is, you know, internationally recognised, mentions that the functional constipation must include two or more of the following. And that can be straining during more than 25% of defecations, lumpy or hard stools, sort of sitting at that one to two on the Bristol stool form, uh, more than 25% of defecations, that sensation of incomplete evacuation, more than 25% of defecations, sensation of anorectal obstruction or blockage, more than 25% of defecations, manual manoeuvres to facilitate more than 25% of defecation. So that's digital, digital evacuation and support of the pelvic floor. Uh, fewer than three smooth bowel movements per week. Loose stools are rarely present without the use of laxatives and insufficient criteria for irritable bowel syndrome. I'm gonna try to get you back again. So that's the, the definition for functional constipation. And I guess what I would say there is, well, my 
do people feel comfortable not moving bow- their bowels daily? Most of my patients don't feel comfortable. So when it says, you know, less than three bowel movements a week, I kind of go, well, I would like to see that change to like one day, once a day is what we're kind of aiming mm-hmm. for, a, a smooth evacuation, no straining, you know, <laughs> minimal hard lumpy stools, that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. So that's where I'm at with the Rome 4 criteria. And also you want to... Um, it sort of branches off into other areas too. You've got Rome, the Rome 4 criteria talking about IBSC, for example. So that subset of people that can experience constipation there and then you've got those that have got uh, um, dyspnergic defecation or propulsive issues with defecation too. So there's sort of definitions for those terms as well. But that's functional constipation in a nutshell. Yeah, um, that's really surprising about how many patients have to digitally evacuate themselves? I mean, that's a concern. That really is. Yeah. I think that's important for practitioners to know so they ask that question because that can be quite um, embarrassing and shameful for people to admit that they're doing. So sometimes a, a part of my case intake is asking these really deep sort of questions or really intimate personal questions. Do you need to use your fingers sometimes to remove the stool? You know, it's, they're not going to offer that information up. Generally, you do need to ask that for some, for most, actually. It, yeah. So let's go through a patient presentation. Like, obviously, you've got to gain their trust. You're delving into quite taboo, often, subjects. And as you said, you know, like, people often feel very uncomfortable, particularly on first meeting, going, g'day, let's talk about something really intimate. Um, That's not the usual conversational style. It's normally like name, address, what do you do, what are your likes and dislikes with social interaction. How do you help your patients to feel comfortable about talking about quite personal habits? Yeah, I think now, though, people are seeking my support because they know I work in the space of constipation, so they're a little bit more open to talking about it. But having said that, lots of people are still not. So I would, because in that hour initial consultation, there is so much to get through, I find, that sometimes we might spill off yeah. five minutes or ten minutes. But if you have a intake form that they can complete prior to your consultation, that shaves yep. a bit of time and, and it really starts to get those questions formed in your head about what you want to ask specifically uh, that patient in that initial consultation. I do ask, you know, um, their main health concern, what they want to work on, uh, health history, of course, before I get into their digestive symptoms. So, and then I get really down into the the nooks and the crannies of, of those particular questions that I want to ask and elaborate on from the questionnaire when it comes to their digestive health. Um, so they're kind of softened up almost. Uh, but they're in that main, what's your main health concern? Generally, people will say, well, I have chronic constipation or I have constipation. Ask them what that means to them as well, because it could mean so many different things. So for someone, it may mean, well, I go every day, but it feels incomplete and it's pebbly. And I feel bloated and gaseous and all the rest of it. And then you've got someone that's like, I don't go for sometimes two weeks, you know. And so you really need to define for them what does constipation mean? How long has it been going on for as well? Um, So I soften it up. I kind of edge some of the questions I probably wouldn't ask in that first consultation if it's not offered up is things like uh, maybe sexual abuse, uh, physical abuse, because sometimes that can contribute to constipation too, especially with things like dyspnergia and the way that um, the pelvic muscle musculature responds and uh, that, how that can affect constipation in our bowel movement. So I may not, I'll just suss it out and I'll see, is this a safe space or, or do they feel comfortable offering up that information? Mm-hmm. I might even say something of, along the lines of, have you had a big past stressor or some big trauma in your past that's created a lot of stress? And they may offer it up when I mention it like that. So, um, yeah, and then I, I tend to... As I said, I can, I, I can go through some of the questions that I ask, but it's generally what most people are probably asking. How often do you go? Um, what colour is it? Do you strain? Is there any blood that you pass in the stools? Uh, do you see any food um, or mucus? Uh, you know, this, Or do you use, as I mentioned, do you use a finger to digitally remove? 
uh, and all other sort of associated s- symptoms that they might be experiencing, like um, lumpy stools, like the character of the actual stool. I may use the Bristol stool chart, but generally I'll ask a bucket load of questions. And yep. sometimes when people have come to me, they've already gone through that. And so they're, they're, they're open to talking about everything. They, they know what to, I fall on the, the one to two level of the Bristol stool chart and that sort of thing. So they're kind of already aware of it. Yeah. Right. So I think you may have answered my next question already. I was going to ask you, how do you sort of categorise in your intake um, the, you know, trivial from the remedial to the possibly sinister disorders? Obviously, you can't see inside the gut. Um, Do you rely on previous scoping and things like that or symptomatology to go, what's going on here? Changes, for instance, in bowel motions, changes of blood, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Well, I do definitely look for those red flags like melina and, and blood. So whether it's bright or dark blood, uh, like uh, weight loss that's come on suddenly, um, rectal pain, for example, those things. I, It's a collaborative effort, I feel, when it comes to constipation. It's rarely just me giving them nutritional advice and supplementation or movement advice. I often work with pelvic floor physios or gastroenterologists or I refer on because especially if it's something that uh, they've tried before when it comes to diet, they've taken laxatives and maybe they're no longer working, then I will recruit the, a pelvic floor physio or a gastro to do further investigation to check if there's dysnergia, um, to do a colonoscopy, those sorts of things. So I think that, yes, there's red flags, but I will just make sure that I have my network of people working for this person. Having said that, not everyone is um, open to straight away recruiting the support of someone like a pelvic floor physio or a gastroenterologist mainly because maybe they want you to fix it or it's expensive yeah. or they're a little bit nervous about what a colonoscopy might entail, all of that sort of thing. So I think that there needs to be a big education around um, why we don't want to leave chronic constipation unattended, why it's important to move your bowels um, so that they really understand and also maybe just discussing what they might experience in a pelvic floor physiotherapy situation so they can kind of feel a little bit comfortable with that because a pelvic floor, a good pelvic floor physio won't be doing a digital rectal exam unless that person's really comfortable, for example. So they, so they, mm. you know, they, so they're really going to gauge that and they're going to obviously create a safe space for this person to do their um, further investigation. So I think... Yeah, hopefully I've answered your question there. I feel like I've completely I, forgot I what that question been. was. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I was going to ask another question. That is that, you know, sometimes a symptom that presents in one area can be um, a manifestation of some other issue. For in, so, for instance, going yes. through my mind is they present with constipation, but the issue um not necessarily causing it but leading to it, uh, a factor in that, uh, might be something like endometriosis. Um, interstitial yep. cystitis, um, ovarian cancer, for instance, yep. um, if you've got tenesmus, things like that. So, like, how on the ball? How how big is your intake form? Like, what? How how do you start questioning people about possible causes? Oh, it's it's in the. I think we should be doing that in our intake form, anyways. It's not that we're just talking about digestive digestive health. I think the intake form is going to be addressing some of those things, as well as the questions that we ask, you know, prior surgeries, um, prior diagnoses, for example. Um, You might want to do some, often you will do blood work that will look at, say, because hypothyroidism, for example, can contribute to constipation. So there's certain things in the blood you want to be ruling out. So I think that there's, you're gathering that information, then you're doing the further testing to establish if there is anything more sinister or a, you know, systemic um, disease going on. Um, and you're also asking the questions about, you know, prior history. And I think those things, you know, should come up, you know. And I feel like yeah. with every consultation, sometimes you're uncovering more and more and more about the mm, patient. For sure. Uh, de- definitely over time. Um, now, you also touched on something that's very important. And, and indeed, in your story, you know, you mentioned about traveling a lot and, you know, you're moving around and you sleep in different hotels, which is a new bed, an unfamiliar place. And that, smacks that tells a story of just how 
easy it is for even a minor stressor to have a large impact on bowel movements. Yeah. So for instance, stress, let's talk about mental health right from trivial to, you know, quite severe. How do you approach this? How do you deal with it? Yeah, I think so many different angles. Uh, when it comes to mental health, someone might, for example, uh, withhold, have withholding behaviour where they are fearful of going to public toilets, you know, and, and not in the comfort of their own home. So they neglect that urge to go to the loo and then that way that, that the stool remains in the colon becomes drier and is harder to pass. So that can lead to things like chronic constipation. So addressing that, addressing, as I mentioned, physical or sexual trauma uh, is important, but, again, recruiting people. You've got to um, recognise your scope of, of uh, expertise. And so I might recruit a psychotherapist or a body worker if a person feels a bit more like drawn to something like somatic, psych what you, somatic therapy. And so where you actually move that trauma through your body versus talk therapy. So I think, you know, getting to know what the person's going to resonate with, but really getting them right. to understand the importance of addressing these things when it comes to mental health because constipation in, in itself can be can cause or contribute to things like anxiety and depression so we want to make sure that we're addressing chronic constipation so that we're you know preventing those impacts on mental health uh, what else do uh, herbs of course so herbs magnesium various supplementation can be really supportive for the nervous system and even things like uh, physical activity so a sedentary lifestyle can contribute to things like constipation. So making sure that person is moving their body, that can support not only bowel movements but really that uh, colon colonic motility in the gut to allow them. Oh, not that's not where I'm going. So, yes, it supports bowel movements, but it, but it also is really impactful for mental health and so really encouraging things like physical movement and it could just be to start with um, some walking, which is excellent for improving bowel movements, so vigorous walking. 30 minutes to 60 minutes a day if they can, you know, so working up to maybe about 45 to 60 minutes. So those are some of the ways that I address mental health, supplementation, movement, recruiting the support of um, other health practitioners like psychotherapists or body workers, um, but also just asking those questions and allowing them to feel really safe. I think even carving out that time to come and see you as a health practitioner is a part of their healing process, feeling heard, mm. Um, you know, feeling safe, feeling like they're they're worth it and they're important, you know, is important. So, and yeah. I mean, yeah. your previous history of being a nurse, um, I, I think about nurses and, and parents tend to neglect themselves, you know, and not, maybe not all nurses, but I get a lot of, I've got a few, a handful of nurses in the industry that they, they don't go to the toilet because they don't have time and they're not drinking enough water because they don't have time. And so, and they're doing shift work as well. So it can really impact digestive health. <laughs> so prioritizing yourself and recognizing that these things are important to get on top of and that you're no good to anyone when you're not looking after yourself, you know? Mm. Uh, yeah. And I, I would um, um, put a stamp on mothers there. They're traditionally the ones that will give everything of themselves and keep nothing or very little for them. Sorry, give everything to everybody else and keep nothing for themselves. Um, <clears throat> just going on about that um, mental health issue, it's really interesting how like, a, you know, a, an acutely anxious um episode um stimulus can sometimes lead to diarrhea even yes. chronic anxiety can lead to diarrhea and that typical picture that we it's almost like a stereotype of ibs the diarrhea dominant um ibs or SIBO, whatever you want to call it but um um but it, it can also go the other way, particularly if somebody has excessive control, that sort of stuff, and, you know, they have yes. things to do. Um, really interesting how you've, you've, you've got to tease apart what could be the possible trigger for that person's, their mm. constitution, their way of handling life. Um, but I, I also see this interplay of, you know, it's kind of like insomnia where the fear of insomnia can keep you awake. 
So it's kind of like this anxiety causing constipation and then constipation causing anxiety about being constipated. Yes. <laughs> where, yeah. where do you intercede? People become here? obsessed. Yep. I do want to add So though, how do you break that I, cycle? Yeah. How do I break the cycle of them being fanatical about bowel movements and anxious about the yeah. fact that they're not going? Yeah. And what I didn't rem- mention, just backpedaling to the stress, is that, yes, it can have the reverse effect, improving, you know, not improving, but creating looser bowel movements. But when you yeah. think about stress's impact on the digestive system, it can slow right. motility in the small intestine. So then yes. you're more prone to bacterial overgrowth such as SIBO or EMO, intestinal methanogen overgrowth. And, um, and you know, yes, it can increase the contractions in the, in the small intestine, but that's really important to note as well because if we have that overgrowth of bacteria in the small intestine, you can really slow down motility and methane is known for doing that especially. Um, how do I tease out that vicious cycle? Oh, it's interesting. I think it's it can be really, I think you, to be honest, I think, as a practitioner, I want to be looking at looking at their drivers. So I want to be diving deep underneath that. But in the meantime, do the basics, start with the basics, yep. start to get them to feel better. So they get a little bit of momentum. And so they start to, you know, if it's sleep, for example, and it's they're ruminating over their bowel movements or whatever it might be, then you want to be looking at sleep hygiene practices. Um, but, you know, I think that it's, you know, supplementation or movement, uh, mindful defecation, those sort of practices. And if they start to go, okay, well, this week I went twice instead of once or no times this week. And so they start to get a little bit of momentum. They start to kind of get a bit more excited and more, um, I guess their, their mind is a bit more nourished and they're a little bit at e- more at ease. But I think and then while we look at really the underlying drivers. So I think, you know, yes, get them to feel better. We work on the underlying drivers. They feel supported, um, are all part of the process of, I guess, breaking that vicious cycle. And if it's something deeper than that, then recruiting or referring on to psychotherapy or those sorts of things I think is really important to, uh, again, yeah. just working within my scope. But just getting momentum and at all Again, feeling them feeling um, heard and safe is really important part of the process of that. Um, I know for myself, even trying to fall pregnant back in the day it took us three years, and the moment that I recruited an IVF specialist, I sat in his office with my husband, and it was I walked out and I was like, right, I don't have to think about it anymore. Someone else is looking after it, even though obviously I have to do the work. Within a week, I was naturally yeah. pregnant because I'd completely surrendered right. and I felt safe. And you hear that quite commonly. So I th- feel as though they're, they're doing something about it. Um, uh, you know, we're changing the way that they eat. Maybe it's a, a way that they always thought was beneficial for them, but maybe not so much anymore. And so, and I think there's a lot of training around which foods are important for um, the bowel because a lot of people have gone down the route of maybe the keto diet or the carnivore diet or those sorts of things that you go jesus christ how do your bowels move so i think there's just like lots of tra- <laughs> there's just lots of training around people shifting their mindset you know on those things yeah again don't know if i uh, answered your question the, but i'm hoping time, i'll did a little bit <laughs> um over your time you're mentioning exercising and talking about walking but over your time in clinic in practice have you found different types of exercise might have different impacts on obviously this is going to work differently for various people but but perhaps Mm. like engaging the core perhaps bending um you know the stretching exercises um versus just the the perambulation um you ever looked at this as part of like oh you know we need to sort of focus on that with you and this with this person another type of exercise with this person? Have you ever teased out anything that works? I guess a few things come up for me when it comes to exercise. If I'm recruiting the help of a pelvic floor physio and they've got something structurally or some pelvic floor musculature that needs to be worked on or some bowel retraining that needs to happen, then they will often give them some exercises to do that would be beneficial for them as an individual. I think walking is a good place to start. Um, 
breath is really important too, no matter what sort of exercise they're doing. I think if they're really supporting, they're not just running through their um, exercise routine, they're, even if they're doing weight training and they're really focusing on breath work and the way that they're controlling, not controlling, but um, engaging their diaphragm is really important. Um, but again, I always just start with things like walking. I think that that's something that they can do that they, it, the the other benefit of that is that they get a bit of nature bathing they get a bit of you know outdoor time possibly and that again mental health so running can be can cause the opposite sometimes sometimes people get loose about movements when they when they run but not always um i am a bit of a fan of yin yoga too not that that's a very cardiovascular sport but when someone's often you'll get the person saying i can't meditate I just can't do it. And so I tend to give them that prescription of try a yin yoga class or I've created some yin yoga um, videos because I used to teach yin yoga. And basically what you do in that, that class is sit in a posture for anywhere between five to ten minutes. And so you're sort of slowly emptying the mind as best we can because we can't have an empty mind, but you're allowing the muscles to relax and you're, you're just, it, it, you're sort of killing two birds with one stone. You're supporting the nervous system. Mm. Um, you know, maybe I see it as a bit of a um, functional meditation, but you're getting a bit of movement in as well. And you can be quite strategic with how you stretch. You know, you might be doing seal, for example, which is just like on the floor and opening up, um, you know, the abdomen, stretching that out. And so I think that, you know, it depends on the person. It depends on what's driving their constipation. If it's normal, functional constipation um, then they might be okay with many types of exercises but if it's something like dysnergic constipation or slow transit and you might again need to engage someone that's going to give them specific individual exercises for what they need to bow retrain yeah yeah and and what about Kegel, other, Kegel exercises you know, aren't great for everyone no <laughs> right yeah um yeah so what about other um pathological conditions like for instance thyroid hemorrhoids um you, you, you've also got um previous surgeries adhesions um yep. you know Direct perhaps seals. they've had a stomach stapling or something like that that might be impeding digestion how do you work around this sort of stuff in regards to exercise or Just, well uh, no everything. no with regards to th general therapy but also perhaps um helping to intercede let's say i mean hashimoto's is so common um mm. but let's say somebody's got hypothyroid you've you've got their medical therapy um and perhaps naturopathic therapy for their thyroid condition now you have this constipatory issue that that's compounding or it is compounded yeah. by their thyroid do you find that you sort of help uh, work to co-manage these how does that work yes I think it's important to co-manage these because I think that especially in the case of thyroid health, you need to be encouraging, you need to have great gut health or good gut health and you need to be encouraging proper elimination of um, byproducts of hormones like estrogen and those sorts of things so that it doesn't impact thyroid health and the production of thyroid hormones. So I think, yes, you're using those therapies, those whether it's pharmaceuticals or naturopathic alternatives to supporting um, thyroid health but you're also using those things, uh, things that help to improve bowel movement function because that's equally as important to managing thyroid health. I think it's a, almost like a bit of a vicious cycle sometimes. You know, you, uh, hypothyroidism can contribute to con chronic constipation. Maybe chronic constipation can, can do very similar things to or impact the thyroid in a negative way. So I think, you know, co-managing them is absolutely important. Um, you don't want them walking away with a bucket load of supplementation, but there's so much you can do in the scope of um, diet, um, fluid intake. Again, like I keep mentioning, pelvic floor physiotherapy, um, that, that can work alongside what they're doing to support the thyroid specifically. Yeah. So, we, I mean, we can talk so much about all of these sort of um, causal factors and antecedents and things like that. It's a whole, it's a whole podcast unto itself, isn't it? But uh, yeah. let's move on to treatments because that's what you're famous for. You've learned from the best in our profession, across the professions. Um, so take us through what you find works for constipation. Where do you start? What do you what do you use to get a result first? Um, not yeah. necessarily a plus 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 plus, but 
effort to get a result? And then how do you sort of fashion in the other aspects of their treatment plan? Yeah, I think when you first see someone, you're doing that thorough case history, asking all the the in-depth questions, and then whilst you're doing that further investigation uh, or waiting for colonoscopy or pelvic floor physiotherapy results then and blood work, then you want to be, uh, while you're waiting for that, the first things that I'll sort of get them to use would be possibly a magnesium formula. Um, and I don't, contrary to popular belief, I don't tend to use oxide, to be honest. I tend to use um, bisglycinate or chelate and mostly because I feel as though we're supporting the nervous system as well as, you know, supporting bowel movements, not just getting in there and creating an, a, an osmotic sort of laxative effect. Like we're getting a, a bit mm. more and often these people are a bit stressed or anxious anyways. Not always, but often. Um, I'll tend to use a prebiotic of, of some sort. So the potential prebiotic partially hydrolyzed glycum is generally my first point of call only because it's tolerated by most. And if I suspect SIBO and or EMO and I'm waiting for those results, I don't want to be giving them maybe inulin or FOS, which can create um, more gas or more issues and discomfort, mm -hmm. digestive discomfort for someone. So I want to be careful with what I'm giving them in, in regards to prebiotics. GOS can be generally um, tolerated by most too. So partially hydrolyzed guar gum or GOS will be given for, for those. And I guess it just depends on the person and what's driving them. I'll, I'll often probably about 98% of the time with the time that I spend with a, a patient, there will be at some point that I will get them to engage a pelvic floor physio. Um, if it can't be fixed with just that normal transit con um, constipation. So if their diet is okay, they're getting enough fibers, they're getting enough polyphenols and prebiotics, um, kind of looking at 25 to 30 grams a day. Most people don't do that. Uh, if they're getting enough water, would you believe, I just, it boggles my mind. People come to see me and they've had chronic constipation for a long time and they're maybe having a glass of water. And it's like, these are the foundational things. Um, having said that, some people are nurses. Having said that, some people might have a prolapse and or they um, have urinary incontinence yeah. and they're a bit frightened, so you kind of want to work with the pelvic floor and, and those sorts of things. So if, if the functional stuff is covered, the basics are covered, movement, water, um, fibre intake, then um, it, and also just retraining on where they can find these sorts of foods, these prebiotic fibres, these fibres, these resistant starches, because yep. these types of foods, uh, resistant starches, and um, go on to feed the bacteria that produces these short-chain fatty acids like butyrate and propionate, which help with uh, colonic motility, so with peristalsis. So those yep. that come to me that are having like a very carbohydrate deficient diet may be experiencing more constipation than someone that is introducing or having more nuts and seeds and legumes and, and some grains and those sorts of things, which can kind of frighten people to reintroduce these things. You just want to kind of take it slowly. Um, as I mentioned, uh, if, I, if there's any red flags, um, then a gastroenterologist is engaged. Um, or if we're just not getting anywhere when it comes to pelvic floor physiotherapy work or um, the, the basics, then I'll engage a gastroenterologist. What else do we do? Movement, as I mentioned. So that's really important. Uh, different types of supplements as we get some of those results back. So maybe in regards to SIBO treatment. So looking at reducing, um, especially that methane picture, that IMO, I, intestinal methanogen overgrowth picture, because methane slows motility. There are things that we can use as part of our um, SIBO treatment to reduce that. And that could be the that one of those things could be that peak partially hydrolyzed guar gum as well as, you know, um, rifaximum or, you know, some of these other natural alternatives. Right. Like, yeah, I don't want to be mentioning any names here, but, you know, some herbs like oregano yep. or berberine and various things to support that. So it really depends on what's happening for someone. Yeah. Um, but even the probiotic strain, DSM-17, can never get it right, lactobacillus, roideri, DS, DSM mm -hmm. 17, I can't remember the name anyways, but that helps to bring down methane overproduction too. So it really depends. Right. We use the functional, we the basics, and then see how we go with that, but engage a pelvic floor physio and then go into, say, if it's more of a secondary um, functional con chronic constipation like medication use or 
um, something like systemic disease, then you want to be referring on or, you know, investigating that for, for like multiple sclerosis or diverticular stricture or even blockages like diverticular stricture or colon uh, cancer. Those things are important to refer on. Yeah, diverticulosis. There's something we never, ever talk about. Yeah. Amazing. Um, Linda, just we have to cover briefly um, treatment outcomes. How do you plan them? What what do you sort of gauge and what do you plan with your patients? And also, where can we learn more? Our treatment outcome, I guess, when I'm engaging a patient, I'm letting them know that we're going to be addressing those symptoms and getting movement as best we can with the basics, starting with the basics. Uh, we're recruiting our... We've got this collaborative thing going on with our other practitioners. Uh, depends on how it really depends on what's going on for someone, how long it's going to take to rectify mm. a excuse the pun, rectify an issue such as chronic constipation. But I think what practitioners need to be aware is that you really want to give things at least a couple of weeks, not just say it's not working within a couple of days or a week, you really want to give things a couple of weeks to get going and that's in regards to supplementation or, you know, movement or um, foods and, and water and those sorts of things. So yeah, it's, yeah, so supporting what's going on for them, treating obviously, um, finding the drivers, so really establishing what those drivers are, working on those drivers, and in regards to things like SIBO, making sure that there's no relapse after there's treatment, and then maintenance, so just ensuring like a wellness sort of diet, like a Mediterranean would probably be your best when it comes to diet, ensuring adequate water intake is maintained. If mental health needs to be addressed ongoing, then ensuring that you're doing that, and then just a, a check-in as they need to. So, you know, you don't want to be with them forever, so, you know, mm. they may, may need to move on, but you just want yeah. to be able to check in every couple of months or whatever to see how they're going and to see how they, they've just not fallen back into old behaviour or they're doing their exercises and doing that Bowery training work. And and where can we learn more? Certainly from Love and Guts podcast. You've got yes. a host of experts that you've <laughs> spoken to. Yes. So Love and Guts podcast, I'm happy to pop in the show notes or you give provide for you the the interviews that are probably more relevant so the ones that i've done on yeah. pelvic dysfunction Great. constipation and pelvic floor and those things and i'm happy to, to send through some uh case studies on those particular things that have known to really support functional constipation like prebiotic fibers and you know those sorts of things and yeah that's where you can find me on my website lindagribridge.com Cool. Linda Gripperich, thank you so much for joining us. I was so excited when you said that you'd be on the show because you are quite famous out there with your Love and Guts podcast. <laughs> Indeed, a couple of my friends were so excited to speak on your podcast. So um, I think oh, it's really funny. Excellent. Hi, Georgia, how are you going? Um, <laughs> She's coming on this Friday. So so. Yeah, oh, oh, again. Um, yes, so, again. So... <laughs> Thanks for taking us through just some of the important points of constipation and how we can intercede to help these people because they're very often in a lot of pain, there's a lot of embarrassment and it's an ongoing issue which we see more and more in our community even though we tend to talk about diarrhoea much more often. Constipation, I feel, is probably a bigger issue out there in the community. Thanks so much for taking us through these important points today on Wellness by Designs. You're very welcome, Andrew, and thanks for having me on. I'm truly, truly honoured. It's our pleasure. And thank you for joining us. Remember, you can find all the show notes and we will put ample up there because Linda has a huge repertoire. So we'll put them up on the on the um, Designs for Health website. You can catch up on all the other podcasts there as well. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm Andrew Whitfield-Cook and this is Wellness by Designs. 